to now introduce uh, Donald Inbody, a professor at Texas uh, State, uh, who is uh, a national, nationally recognized expert on military voting, and we welcome you, Professor Inbody. Well, thank you. <coughs> I uh, teach at Texas State University, which was actually a second career after 28 years in the Navy. So when I started getting into my uh, academic research, uh, understanding the military voter just was kind of a natural area. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the UOCAVA voter, what we know about it so far statistically, and then based on my conversations uh, with a lot of local election administrators around the country, what, what appears to work and, and, and put those out as some uh, good ideas to think about. The main problem, the principal problem faced by overseas and military voters is how to get a marked ballot back to the appropriate local election jurisdiction in time to be counted. There's a lot of related problems to that, but if you want to cut to the core, that's the simple nature of the problem. There's also a serious problem with turnout rate. There's some four and a half to five million overseas citizens based on varying estimates. The turnout from them appears to be around 12% of military overseas. Uh, it's about 19%. That's a rough estimate. You heard the previous testimony. How many of our military voters are returning their ballots from overseas? We don't really know, but when I talk to local election administrators, I get a uniform answer of about one-third of the UOCAVA ballots are coming back from overseas. That is, at best, a rough count. Um, I have some recommendations on that later that we can discuss if you're interested in that. Um, Of the two problems between getting the ballot back and the turnout, I think the one that we can actually deal with statutorily and administratively is probably just getting the process sorted out. We can't fix the turnout rate, at least not easily, but we can minimize some hurdles and barriers. Um, there's been some questions here earlier about metrics. What is an appropriate metric for this particular issue? Um, the real test of success with overseas voters or even the, the broader group of UOCAVA voters, including even domestic military, is probably not how many of the potential voters are contacted or are convinced to actually cast a ballot, but probably should be how many of those who choose to cast a ballot have it successfully counted. And I think that's a part of the main problem that we're finding is that too many of the ballots that are submitted for a number of reasons don't get counted. Here's the, uh, the ballot return rate um, that we've noted between 2008 and 2012. The 2012 numbers are uh, estimates based on uh, some of what we've been able to get back from uh, various states. The Election Assistance Commission uh, hasn't put out the report yet. It probably won't come out till the fall, but we've been able to piece together uh, information directly from states between uh, myself and the Overseas Vote Foundation. And it appears that the basic here is that the rate that which requested ballots were actually returned for counting is gone up uh, over the last four years. That's, of course, good. And we think the increase is probably due to experience with the system now, growing experience by the voters themselves, along with several years of publicity uh, and combined education. The, the work that um, the Federal Voting Assistance Program is doing is good. Um, we think there's probably some improvements can be made. The Overseas Vote Foundation, who you've already heard from, has some very laudable efforts. And many of the states have taken some very specific steps to make their websites easier and to get their, their information out. I think uh, that needs to be more uh, uniform and needs to be redoubled. Still, a third of all mailed UOCAVA ballots are returned undeliverable. Um, as you know, the the UOCAVA voter submits a federal postcard application. 45 days prior to the election, they mail out the ballots uh, as those may be requested. Uh, con the consistent response across the board is about a third of them get returned undeliverable. And that is, of course, somewhat understandable since the crowd that they're sending it to, the population they're sending it to, are a mobile crowd and the address could very well have changed and often has from the time between they submit the FPCA to the time that it is mailed out. Um, local election officials are uniformly uh, frustrated by that. Um, they feel kind of hamstrung. They, in many cases, 
know through other sources that the ballot they're about to mail is going to be returned, but they have to do it because of local laws. Um, that, that, that sort of an issue. Another one, it raises issues of they mail the ballot out uh, and then later on get an electronic request. How do you deal with that? Uh, some local election administrators have state laws that permit them to deal with that. Others bend the law to make those things happen. Um, uh, and then there's, of course, the issue of we mailed out a UOCAV a ballot and they show up in person on election day or early election, how to deal with those things. So there's still some blanks in the laws that need to give the local election officials some flexibility and the ability to deal with those sort of things. According to the Overseas Vote Foundation, which is the only really good survey right now, 22% um, of overseas voters uh, reported that their ballot that they requested was either missing or late. Late includes late like after the election or too late to respond. Now, the actual number is open to some question because of the nature of the survey and the Overseas Vote Foundation admits that, but clearly there is some sizable group of people who, for whatever reason, don't get the ballot. Now, um, we do have, there's been a lot of talk about the postal systems here. There's really good evidence that the postal system can deliver mail overseas in less than a week. Um, there was some discussion I had with an election administrator and the Secretary of State in Minnesota. They did some looks that they could get a vote, a, a ballot from Minnesota to Bagram Air Force Base routinely in four days. The problem is downstream from there, getting it out into the field, out to the soldier, the Marine in the field, and then getting it back. And then, of course, that starts the process. The return route is invariably longer than getting it out there. Of the ballots that came back, one-third were rejected or not counted because they were late. The ballot missed whatever the state deadline is. There's a problem there that is confusing to a lot of overseas voters. Yeah, uh, these laws vary state by state. Some states require the ballot to be back by election day. Uh, I know Texas allows five days, Florida allows 10 days. Um, yes, I know they're citizens of a state and they ought to know their state's rules, but they get a lot of advice from other people and then local, the military election or voting assistance officers often just don't have the training or to know what these variations are. Um, we wonder if some kind of standardization as close as we can get among states to allow these overseas ballots at least to come in late might not be helpful. There's been some other talking too about permitting the use of tracking data on, on ballots that if there is reasonable evidence that the ballot was actually marked before whatever the deadline is that it be counted just regardless of when it actually arrives. That may be uh, worth exploring. And then the other problem is the confusion over the federal write-in absentee ballot and but what you can do with it and wide variation between states. Some states use it as a single source document, both registration and casting a ballot. Others, it is only casting a ballot. Um, about a third of FWABs are rejected. Um, a lot of reasons for that. The number one reason, uh, there was no federal postcard application on file. So the ballot arrived and in effect they weren't registered to vote. So that's the number one reason that we're seeing on that. And so perhaps some sort of uh, legislation by states that allows FWABs to be used as a single source of registration and a, a voting document simultaneously. And then of course now you have to get into variations in states on registration limitations. Is it 30 days? Is it 15 days? Is it election day? That sort of issues. Um, again, this just adds to the confusion of the overseas voter that these state wide variation in state laws um, just add to the confusion. You've seen this slide before, the Overseas Vote Foundation produced it, but it, it kind of shows where I think the future is going. Uh, most people got their FPCAs electronically. However, most people submitted their FPCA by mail, even though it would be perfectly legal in many cases to send them electronically. Most of the, this 2012 marked kind of the tipping point, most of the returned um, uh, or the transmitted ballots for UOCAVA were transmitted electronically. We think just over half were transmitted electronically. Uh, that's a good trend. We hope that increases because that will reduce at least the outbound time. It will also reduce the mail 
returned on deliverable level. So we think that that's a good thing and ought to be encouraged. However, notice the last box, uh, ballot being returned largely due to state laws. Nearly all of those ballots were then returned by post and not electronically. Some states permit electronic return of overseas ballots. Uh, some limit it to uh, combat or personnel in combat zones. I know Texas just passed a law to permit one county to do a pilot program for uh, any voter who is drawing uh, hostile fire pay to be able to return their ballot electronically. Uh, read that to be, they get the ballot, fill it out, scan it into some form like a PDF, and then email it or fax it back um, to the state. They're gonna do a one county test. Other states are already doing that. Um, now there's a lot of course re resistance to electronic casting a ballot due to security reasons, but I echo uh, the previous uh, panels, uh, the Mr. Lux, um, who is absolutely encouraging that we need to, for at least the overseas voter, and if not for all overseas voters, at least for the military overseas voters, um, that, that permits some method of electronic return of the ballot to again cut down on some of the, uh, the problems in getting ballots back. So what do we know? We know that UOCAVA ballots um, are up, the return is up, again, likely to experience an education. We also know that the electronic blank ballot instructions are confusing. My favorite election administrator in Texas, uh, Jackie Callahan, uh, Jackie Callanan down in Bear County, uh, loves to bring out her box of returned ballots from overseas. And it is this amazing conglomeration of people and how they interpreted how to return this electronic ballot and, the, and the, the, the common thing is you have to have a PhD in origami to be able to get all of these things all put together again. Now to the local election administrator's credit, as long as there's reasonable evidence that the ballot actually came from a registered voter, they're going to do whatever they can to count it, including those ballots that don't come in a security envelope, they'll do what they can. The local election administrators are bending over backwards to do that, but it's clear that the instructions don't uh, pass muster because it's, uh, the confusion is obvious. And so, and I've already mentioned the um, issues about FWAB acceptance and the deadline of received ballots. So what works? Um, I've got eight best practices that seem to uh, be working is uh, encourage the increased use of electronic ballot delivery. Add to that the mail tracking that has been discussed here before so that those that are actually sent by mail, they know where the ballot is, where they go astray, and in real time or near real time know if a ballot has taken too long to get somewhere and some kind of step can be taken to track it down. We think that um, there ought to be extended ballot receipt time, at least for the people who live overseas, something beyond election day. In those cases where there was that extended time, the rejection for late uh, was reduced. Uh, we think that for at least overseas people and at a minimum for uh, military assigned overseas that there ought to be some form of electronic ballot return. The uh, increasing the use of the FWAB as a dual purpose document, again, there's a, just a ton of confusion over how to do that. Um, a lot of states are already doing this and they seem to be uh, having good success with it. Uh, one issue that I didn't mention earlier was that when um, a lot of these overseas ballots come in, they have to be manually transferred to the form that can be scanned in, which involves a human, usually two people with observers, manually transcribing it onto another form. That, of course, increases the likelihood of human error involved. Um, if that gets combined in the electronic return, uh, we've noticed that... Um, some of those technologies that are out there have reduced a marked ballot to a barcode, um, which is a good process, except when combined with overseas printers that use different size paper, sometimes that barcode gets cut off, and this is part of the problem that has been going on there. So there, there's clearly some uh, technological issues that are involved. The problem with the barcode scanning thing right now is those are nearly all proprietary softwares. Um, and there's no common standard on that. Um, we think uh, giving local election officials um, a little more flexibility, I've talked about some of that, the ability to uh, make some decisions, a little more flexibility in how to decide which ballots ought to be counted and which ones can't. Um, uh, the law basically uh, allowing certain things, especially for overseas voters, um, it seems to, uh, to be helping out. 
uh, in limited cases, and I've had more than one local election administrator mention this, and I wouldn't have thought of it except they bent my ear with it, is they have seen certain cases where the de they al a law allowing the designation of an administrative proxy, a person to help in the preparation of the completed ballot. The specific cases they were talking about were soldiers overseas in um, uh, arduous areas, very difficult to do it, to where they could establish some sort of a secure means of, of communication with them. And he says, what I want to do, and somebody prepares the ballot for him, at least administratively, and then something along these lines. Um, no state is doing that now, but a several administrators were suggesting that in limited cases, that may be a valuable uh, possibility. And then eighth, uh, I think that's been a common theme here, is the education of the UOCALA voter has to be redoubled. And that's a, a multi-factor uh, issue. Uh, DOD, particularly FVAP, needs to do better in what they're doing. Uh, not that what they're doing is bad, but I think there needs to be more. Um, the Overseas Vote Foundation is doing a pretty good job, but they're a small nonprofit. And uh, some states do a much better job than other states in terms of single points, to go to get information and feedback. And then finally, data collection. Um, I think it was mentioned before, uh, the way the laws are written right now, you have overseas citizens and you have military voters. And in most of the data that's collected, particularly by the EAC, it lumps all military voters as the same. And we, it's hard to pick out which are overseas and which are domestic in terms of just being able to in, uh, figure out what the difference is in those populations. While the overall military population tends to vote at about the same rate as the general population, it's clear to me anyway, based on what limited data I have, that the overseas military population is voting at a much less uh, rate than the, the general population is. And then the last thing is a question that is continually asked is, what is the military turnout rate? How are military people turning out to vote? The only data that is presented right now is by the FVAP for their, for their uh, post-election survey. All of that is based on uh, self-reported data. Yes, I voted. No, I didn't vote. We know from the national election study in the past when we were allowing that to be validated is that number tends to be inflated by anywhere from 10 to 15 percent. Um, and so if you look at that, the FVAP rates, if you subtracted 10 to 15 percent from the FVAP reported rates, it looks kind of like the general population, which actually doesn't surprise me a bit. Based on my other research about uh, political behavior of military people, it tends to match the general population in general. So um, I've got more of these details in the short paper that I submitted. Um, I thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk about these, and of course, I'm ready to answer any questions that uh, you may have.